programul de sunt de nasă țară se numește în pragă independente. Noi ne-am propus cu acest program de firme să urmărim pe departe istoria recentă a Ucrainei, să contextualizăm cumva războiul care se întâmplă în ziua de azi, dar în același timp să venim și cu documentare din puncte de vedere subiective care arată experiența oamenilor din prezent. Iar acest parcurs istoric este inaugurat astăzi cu această selecție de firme. Ea constă din două scurtmetraje din anii 87 și 92. Iar aceste filme sunt complementare, artistic, dar și istoric, dar în același timp urmăresc și această tranziție dintre societatea sovietică și societatea democrată. Primul film este titulat Mâine e sărbătoare, de gizorul Sergei Bukovsky din 1987 și ne povestește despre nemulțumirea lucrătorilor la o fabrică avicolă, surprinzând și o criză profundă socială, care era deja incipiată de mai mult timp. Aceasta este cumva actualizată în al doilea documentar, care surprinde deja aceeași mișcare, dar pe la o scară mult mai largă de protest. Filmul al doilea se va numi Pertele Democrației și este un colaj de mai multe manifestații publice de protest, pentru care și Revoluția de Granit, care se cunoaște fi istorică și primul Maidan. Cam asta e programul filmelor de astăzi. Vă invităm să ne întoarcem în anul 91, înaintea acestui punct de costură și să simțim cu oamenii care au primit acele timpuri, suspansul acelor vremuri, frustrările lor, dar și entuziasmul care au rescris această istorie. va fi moderată de către Igor Cașu. Igor Cașu este uh, istoric și director la Agenția Națională de Arhive. Este, de asemenea, uh, lector la Facultatea de Istorie și Filozofie, um, dar și la universități internaționale, unde ține prelegeri despre foamea postbelică, precum uh, în universitățile din Toronto, Yale, Harvard. The movies are very, very interesting and uh... The choice was very uh, inspired in the sense they are showing us uh, the transition from a totalitarian communist regime uh, to a post-totalitarian rather than a democratic society, democratic regime, because it's a long, long way to, to democracy. It's like in the uh, Soviet movie, Dolga Doroga Dyuna. Dolga Doroga Democratie, da? 30 years of democracy. Uh, these movies are showing the um, social and ethnic divisions in, in Soviet society, in, in Soviet Ukraine in this case, and of course our Moldavian uh, colleague here, colleagues here are uh, recognizing uh, that a lot of similarities between what happened in Ukraine at that moment, starting from 1987 when the first movie was shot, 
and uh, continue with the, the, the second movie, which was shot in 92, but it covers basically the, the last years of the Soviet Union from 89. So here we have a lot of, a lot of similarities, I would say, from 87 to, to 1991, um, and even to 92, because in 92 you have these strikes in, uh, you have this uh, uh, protest in, in downtown Kiev. Uh, people gathered from all over the, the Ukraine, especially from the western parts, as it seems the case. Uh, the people that, that uh, talked uh, in this movie, in the second part. And in 92, we, had, uh, we didn't have, let's say, protest in downtown Kishinev, but we had a, a war. Uh, which we called the Dniester War. So it was, uh, uh, let's say, the hottest moment in the, in the wider Transnistrian conflict. Yes, from March um, 1992 to, to July 92. And actually, this is the day when, when the war started, yes, on the 2nd of March 1992. So, so it's kind of symbolic of you. You have chosen the, the, the second movie. Um, okay, so we, we can move later on, on comparisons, but let me try to, um, to underline some ideas that could serve for, uh, for further discussion. Um, the, the first movie is, is, is about uh, social uh, problems in the region of Kyiv. The second one is more related to ethnic national issues. And basically this is the way the uh, perestroika, let's say, developed. Yes, it was, it was in the beginning, um, let's say, um, uh, it was a program for social, political uh, revival of the Soviet regime. And then it turned into ethnic national uh, strife, and national tensions all over the Soviet Union. And actually, uh, the, actually, the the uh, the failure to solve the social problems and to to revive the Soviet regime, the the, the communist, uh, let's say, regime, was a natural, let's say, uh, uh, result of of uh, turning to and sticking basically to national ideas. So, so, and, and basically it's, it's, and you have seen here this division between uh, Ukrainian national movement, which was led by Ruk, which is actually Front Popular de la Noi. The second movie is, is, uh, is um, moving to the, to the national uh, issues. And then in the end of the, of the of the um, uh, second movie, you have, uh, an, let's say, both social and national uh, issues together. Yes, you have, and, and you have this, uh, uh, like, okay, it's about anti-Semitism, but you, you see the, uh, uh, what, what the guy says, yes? Everybody, you know, the, the Jews were, uh, our leaders, uh, starting from, from Lenin and, and, and Stalin, and uh, uh, Stalin the Jew is interesting, a Georgian Jew, and, and Beria also a Georgian Jew. Actually, Beria was an Ukrainian, actually, a minority within Georgia. Anyway, it's, it's an interesting, uh, uh, let's say, simplification of, of, of the history of the world. <laughs> uh, 
and then with, with Christian ideology, so I said it's not about religion, it's about ideology as well, because uh, Jesus Christ was a Jew. So. Um, so, so basically, let me invite you to uh, for discussion. Uh, the monologue is not the best way to um, uh, at this moment and in this in this space. Uh, so let me let me ask you. What what were the reasons behind the the present day ongoing war between Russia and, and Ukraine? Let's go farther from the revolutionary classic question of Tovinavad. Let's try to understand why this is happening. Please. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, for doing my, my name is Anton. Yes. Um, I would disagree slightly. I, I think in Kyrgyzia and Tajikistan and in many countries, in, in many post-Soviet countries, things also are complicated. Yes, and of course, of course. Yeah, like, I think that institutions which really take a lot of time to build are uh, quite, quite hard to build as well. And uh, th 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 that's why the transition is so complicated. The democratic institutions, so like the, the, the balances of power and uh, yeah, civil society and all of them. In my view, it's difficult everywhere, probably except the Baltics, the Baltic republics. But still, I mean, uh, yes, Kyrgyzia had several uh, rose revolution, whatever, several kind of uh, internal strife, even civil wars, but but uh, Ukraine is the only okay. It's not uh, Ukraine; it's fault, of course. But I mean, Ukraine is the, in the most difficult position when Ukraine decided to go out of this club, which was Soviet Union, and then. Uh, Commonwealth of Independent States. So here we have a full-scale war uh, in Europe on that issue. So what? How, how we can explain that? Are you from Ukraine? Or? No, 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 I'm from okay. here. Um, th 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 there is this uh, idea that um, uh, no, that no, no Hitler, no Holocaust that Holocaust was, was in the mind of the Hitler. So it could be, it, it was very possible that uh, Germany would turn, so, turn into authoritarian regime, even in a dictatorship, but uh, the Holocaust was like largely in, in, the, in the mind of one person. And so may, maybe it's also here, maybe like Russia as it is, if it was not uh, for, for Putin, if Putin would, wouldn't come, maybe the, the war wouldn't happen. So, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's very complicated. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, not in, it's not only complicated, it's, it's very simplistic, I think, to, to say that uh, Holocaust yeah. it was because of, of, of Hitler, one, one guy. It's very easy to personalize. The question, there okay, let's, but let's, yeah, the there's there's a theory, I mean, of course, uh, as any theory, uh, everyone uh, has the right, let's say, to, this is to be expressed, but if we assume Hitler is to be blamed personally for that, the second most, I think, uh, problematic question is to answer is why the whole nation goes with him, yes? So the, the same question could be with the Putin. Yes. Okay. Let's personalize. Let's let's assume. Yes. Putin is is to be blamed. Yes. He's a dictator. Uh, but uh, the the second question comes: Why the, the the whole nation? Yeah. There is some opposition, of course. But still, there is no revolution in Russia. Yes. The people are dissatisfied. You know, it, I, I like the, the idea that somebody expressed when the mobilization starts, uh, started in, in, in Russia and, uh, and some protests tried, you know, started to be uh, expressed. Some, and somebody said, it's actually, it's a, 
It's a guy from, from Chisinau who is uh, living for the last 20 or 30 years in, uh, in St. Petersburg, said, Ruskie ni protiv vajne, ani protiv mobilizacije. So, uh, it's a way we can discuss, but I think it's, it's very simplistic to personalize uh, what is happening now uh, in the Russian-Ukrainian war, or even in, in, in other instances uh, related to the Second World War, to Holocaust. Yeah, no, no, well, the thing I try to say is that the, the, the so, uh, there, 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 there is always a trigger. Maybe it's boiling inside, but there is always a trigger. And uh, I don't know. As a Hitler, uh, it probably wouldn't come to to to, to sound this like, huge hatred. Yeah, of course, in Germany, people were like the, 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 there was bias against Jews, but um, someone really pushed it forward. And yeah, of course, Germans were, were to blame, and Russians, like ordinary Russians. But maybe there, there was not one person or, or a couple of them which would push this. It wouldn't happen. Uh, th th that's my opinion. Uh, but I can ask just as well, like, when you have the whole country and only one person in charge, if they do not agree with him, why like, they do nothing about it as well? Because uh, I think the point here as well is uh, if Ukraine we see this um, development and there were a lot of stages where Ukrainian, um, Ukrainians were able to show that word democracy is not like just a word for them because we had several revolutions and we've seen like there were like three or four major uh, strikes that were happening in, in the last film. Um, so that happened during like the first few years of independence and after that uh, there was um, a try of Yanukovych, our third or fourth president, uh, to fourth president. But at first when he was balloting he was trying to uh, fake the elections and there were like a huge strike and the whole country was striking against it so it was like a breaking point to prove that democracy is a thing and it's actual need of society. Where in Russia there was, I don't see like in the history such a big movement and if we like looking in, U in Ukraine, we had some like pro-Russian party but we have this uh, democracy when even they are allowed to be inside of the parliament and we have really strange parties, sometimes some strange people uh, that are becoming a politics, some oligarchs as well, but there's like a melting pot of them uh, from different regions as well. But in Russia, they're very trying to be like the second Soviet Union. So they're making these allies, economical allies, um, military alliances as well, uh, and they're trying to coop these uh, countries, ex-countries from Soviet Union together. So there was even this idea when they tried to make this um, union uh, country with Belarus, uh, Belarus, or Belarus, Belarus. Um, so and they're like very deeply into their cultures, their economics, and they're making these countries dependent on them. So that's like what happened uh, when Ukraine didn't want to be in that part of alliances and. Um, because th there is no progress, they're just trying to repeat the same thing that, that was made in Soviet Union. And in every speech of Putin, he's saying like, oh, there was a great country. On the last of his speeches on this, this big stadium in Moscow, he w uh, people were waving not Russian flags, but also Soviet Union flags. That's because that's a thing for them, and as well as its structure, um, what it should be like a democracy, but still they have only one party, uh, dominant in uh, uh, Russia, it's very hard to register your own political uh, party. And uh, even though Navalny is uh, not as good as everyone pictures him, but still every opposite, um, every like opponent to political system existence is uh, put under pressure and arrested. So it's like the huge difference.
that's, that's the difference, I see. So, like, th there was no, like, breaking point for Russian people to prove that actually they're against it, and they're just following orders uh, because they didn't, uh, as we see in that film, Ukraine, like, really felt that, oh, we need to prove, uh, so, well, Soviet Union is broke, broke, has broken apart. So now we have to build something new, and that was a difficult process of proving and learning on mistakes, and all these protests are about mistakes that are a government making, and the people are not uh, quite getting alone and living with them. Uh, so I didn't see that breaking points in Russia. And that's why, like, yeah, that's like the way people can show they do not agree. If they are not trying hard enough, that means they probably support it. So it's also blame on them. Yeah, basically, basically, agree that the failure of Russia to build a democracy actually led to, to the war. Russia is the, actually the, the perpetrator of the, of the, of the war uh, against uh, Ukraine. And, and Russia is the, let's say, the former empire that doesn't want to accept the new geopolitical realities. And I think here you, 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 have, you have Russia, let's say, uh, not learning from history. Uh, you can compare, you can, you, can, uh, you can remind, I can remind you, the, I think you can compare the present day war, Russia against Ukraine, with the France uh, war against uh, Algeria. The, the, the Algerian independence war, which was three years, yes, from 1958 to nine, four years actually, from 58 to 62. Hopefully, the Russian Ukrainian war will not last so long. But still, I, I see a lot of similarities because you had in the, in the Algerian war also, you had a certain part of society, let's say 20, 30 percent, that uh, were for Algeria to remain a part of France. And these people were the former colonists, French colonists in Northern Africa, especially in Algeria. So they wanted to become, they were the, the colonizers, yes, they, uh, and they wanted to be a part of the France. And 60, 70 percent of the Algerians, the ethnic Algerians, uh, wanted to become uh, independent. So here I think we have some, some similarities, but the main question is that uh, Russia uh, could not learn from, from this. The most, let's say, recent experience in, uh, in uh, the decolonization, let's use yeah, but it's the... quite difficult to compare the friends because of Algeria and France, they have uh, distance, yeah? And uh, here yeah, is, is a Soviet Union that was totally unit yeah. and yeah, officially, yeah, unofficially uh, USSR don't speak that it's yeah, yeah, uh, empire, that. yeah? And the ordinary people don't yeah, understand don't what it was there, um, this Soviet Union. Yeah, and we, 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 when we start to yeah. speak about decolonization, yeah, it's yeah, quite yeah, difficult to understand what was the past. But uh, for me, it's quite interesting to go not, not only USSR, but more a longer period, for example, 300 years, yeah? And how this territory was uh, influenced and was metropolis and the periphery territory, how they can uh, work together. And we will see that um, not so many things changed during the Soviet period. It was the same, like a periphery territory, and there was a metropolis, which control these um, spaces. And now we see that um, it's also continuous, this past colonialism. And this uh, where, where in the Ukraine, I think it's uh, was one, of, one of the reasons to continue to be a periphery of this USSR, of this uh, Russia. Okay, but it doesn't mean that you can, you can say they are the same, but, but I Comparison could be justified when you have uh, at least several elements of this comparison. Of so course, of course, in the Ukrainian case, it's more more difficult uh, because it's the, the Russia, the Tsarist Russian Empire, the Soviet Empire was uh, was uh, land empire, 
there is contiguity between the metropolis and the, the, the colonies, even though the, the colonies not every time in, in the Tsarist and especially Soviet history, Soviet Empire, the, 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 the colonies were not uh, the same as in the overseas empire, a classical empire. Yes, yeah. sometimes the colonies had some privileges of the, the people in the in the in the in the some uh, national peripheries. Colonies lived better than the, the center. If you take Russia as a whole, not Moscow. Moscow, of course, lived better than others. But if you take Russia as a whole, the the level of the uh, of living uh, was uh, for most of part, I would say. Of the existence of the Soviet Union was lower than the level of consumption. Mm -hmm. The peripheries, if you take, for instance, the Baltics, even even uh, Soviet Moldavia in the in the 80s, in the 80s, uh, you can see from the official statistics. Of course, you can say statistics are falsified. Of course, we can we should we should uh, uh, be careful here. But still, I think we have some, some instruments uh, uh, that shows very, very clearly that what, what means in the Soviet case, the colony is not the same as, as in the yeah. classical overseas empires. That was a consumer, Sidney Abbas, from the Greek Yes, Soviet Yes, for me, quite uh, easy, clear to speak about what was in your society. That it's, we can see no level of uh, different sides of uh, the state, from a modernity state and from uh, So, so we, ha we, ha uh, we have seen a progressive things from the USSR that was uh, some kind of legacy, some kind of uh, modernization. Uh, but in the same time, uh, we can see Pachinenia, Nasilia, violence and subjugation. subjugation. And so we must do balance it between uh, two different um, type of uh, construction of this uh, state. Yes, let me give an example about this, this colony periphery and then empire relationship or center periphery. Um, of course, when the Soviet Moldavia was not the, the most discriminated republic in the Soviet Union. Yes, economically, yes. I, I did my PhD on the Soviet National States Policy and I had a chapter there back in 2000 in Romania. Um, and, and I had the question, was Soviet Union discriminated in terms of uh, economic investments uh, in, the, in the local economy, economy from, the, from, from Moscow? And what, what is interesting is that you have every year, you have uh, an increase in, in uh, capital investments, let's say, but at the same time, and here you have the, I think, the essence of the Soviet Empire. You have you have investments raising and raising every year. But, and we have uh, documents from the archive as well. But what is happening is that the center, Moscow, is giving investments, but and, and the whole economy of the republic is is going up. Yes, from year from year to year, on continuous basis, I would say. But what is happening, and this is the colony empire issue, the people who um, are benefiting, first of all, from this investment from the center, are people that are chosen by, by Moscow, but not by local authorities, yes. you see? There is a case of Bodiu. I will give you an example. Bodiu, which is in Moldova, uh, associated with uh, uh, stagnation and uh, economic stagnation, which is not true actually, but basically with uh, discrimination against the local national elites, national um, um, uh, national sentiment, and all that stuff. He was behind um, the resuscitation of, of Moldova. About 20 years, yes, from 61 to 1980, and he was a friend of Brezhnev, good connections in Moscow, yes. And he sent a letter in late 60s, yes. He says this year it was in May June. He says this year we have will have 
30,000 30, graduates from the schools, yes? And uh, technical school and so on. And we don't have working places, we don't have industry in order to employ them, yes? So he raises a social question, yes? Because socialist communism was about superiority over capitalism, especially in terms of we don't have unemployed, yes? We should, we should solve, solve that question, yes? What was the result of this request? Moscow gave money to build uh, more industrial enterprises here, but the problem that Bodu raised was not solved. You know what? Why? Because the people who worked in this industrial enterprise were selected by Moscow from outside Moldova. So you have here the specificity of the Soviet regime, you have economical development, modernization, and so on and so on. Yes, as a whole, the Republic and the Baltics and others, but in the case of of Estonia, for instance, it was even more dramatic. There were 90% ethnic Estonians in, uh, in 1945, and the proportion uh, was 60% in 89. 60%. So you have the 30% colonization. Yes, in another area, in Tallinn, still you go in Tallinn, you see, you know, Estonia, Estonia, you know, half of the Tallinn is. Russia speaking, yes, but also it's it's there are differences. They are speaking also Estonian, more Estonians, more let's say non-Estonians spoke Estonian in the Soviet period, and now basically everybody speaks Estonian, which is not the case of Moldova, which is not the case in, in Ukraine still recently, yes, and in other republics, former former Soviet republics. So here I think is, uh, but let's let's not forget we are speaking basically about uh, Ukraine. Uh, and you ask why it's more difficult? So you see that it's more difficult uh, if we compare with other republics, because your question was. The the, the question was yes, the, every republic had a difficult transition, yeah. but still, as we can see, as we are speaking, uh, there is a war going on which is related to the to the to the fact that Ukraine wants to build its own future independent from Russia and Russia does not want to let it go. Yeah because there are a myth that the Russian world consists of two nations Russian Ukraine and Belarusian. This is Putin's vision. Yes. It's myth from from there. Maybe it's, uh, in this way it's more problematic, but, but we're also in the periphery of this territory. It's an echo of the 19th century uh, Slavophiles uh, intellectuals. Uh, but, but as you can see, it's not true. It's not true uh, at all. So, so you, have, you have a Ukrainian... And you know what is interesting, if you want me to... No, not to provoke you too much. But uh, if you see, uh, if you compare Putin's views on Ukrainians, uh, they are more radical than Stalin's views on Ukrainians. Stalin, you know, Stalin is, of course, he's the main perpetrator of the Holodomor of the 1930s, uh, which killed um, about 5.5 5, uh, million uh, Soviet citizens out of them about 4 million Ukrainians. So, so Stalin is the perpetrator of the, of the Holodomor. Um, but what, what, what I wanted to say, if you, if you allow me to, uh, the, the tragedy of the Ukrainian history is that Ukrainians suffered, uh, not, probably not the most, but let's say, uh, I, I mean in, in terms of mass killings and the Holodomor and the Second World War and repressions after the war, deportations and, and executions and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a martyr nation, let's say, 
one, one of the, uh, the nation that, that suffered one of the you know in, in the top let's say if you if, if numerically let's say uh, and proportionally to the total population at the same time I think uh, another idea uh, why why this is happening now the war between Russia and Ukraine is that the, the Ukrainians after the Second World War, especially 19, uh, after 1954, uh, the Ukrainians were upgraded to the second brother nation, a uh, big brother nation. Yes, and, and, and it, it was in 54 when Crimea was given to uh, from from Russia to to Ukraine, and of course it was Khrushchev who was. Yet nuclear Russian, but I think he was he was Ukrainian basically. Um, so 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 that's why I think it's I think Ukraine yet yeah, suffered a lot because of the Soviet regime. At the same time, in the last four three four decades, let's say of the Soviet regime, regime, they also were the most co-opted nation after the Russians. The, the second dominant nation in the in the in the Soviet Union, and that's why you know they, they were very close. The the most crucified. Sorry, guys, I'm not trying to justify the war now, but I'm trying to understand why it's so violent. This split is so violent because they were so close, like the Siamese story kind of. And if one wants to go apart, it can. Sorry for saying that, but. I, I don't see another explanation more convincing. So, so violence, from my point of view, was inevitable. If, because they were so close. Uh, yeah, please. And, and the reason they were so close, because uh, it started also from aggression, Russian aggression, because like, if you're looking in the whole history of Ukraine, uh, in each different forms, it, will all, it always had conflicts with Russia. Even we go back to them, Kazaki, Tagdale, they still had conflict. There was like, it's our main opponent, I don't know, for like six, seven hundred years already. And like, uh, Russia all the time uh, views us, uh, I'm from Ukraine, and as, uh, as a small brother and like, part of them eventually, and we shouldn't discuss it. And every time uh, people are trying to point that, oh, you see, but we are different. We have our own language, we have our own culture. And it uh, happens that they're trying to make us forget. So uh, when, so if we are talking about Soviet Union time, there were lots of uh, Stuff. They were making laws about forbidding our language, forbidding our uh, literature, forbidding everything. Our main poets, writers, uh, musicians were killed. All of them. We had even we have even a term called "rostrilne um, vidrodzhenya," which can be translated as "shoot it Renaissance." So we had like a huge pack of like. Um, very educated, modern people, writers, historians, uh, everyone. And they were just brutally killed. So it was like thousands of people and it was like an ultimatum. So you are close with us, you are speaking Russian, uh, or we are killing you. And it was like all the time. So this was the reason for us to be together during Soviet times, because it was the only way to live or we are gonna be killed. Because we happen to be in this situation when we cannot move, and all and like all the history of Ukrainian ideas during Soviet times, so it was like attempt to survive and cultivate Ukrainian ideas uh, secretly, because in other words, you're going to be uh, murdered, and that's like it's happening. And even the Russian Empire they had the same. So our like I don't know, I can't remember the the, the number. But our language was forbidden like more than hundred times during like the start of our relationship with Russia. So in, even during Katerina uh, uh, so 
she, yeah, she killed all the Cossacks. Uh, so we had like this Nazbi uh, Kazaki. На момент, по-моему, 1700 х годов это был как раз такой плод украинской идеи. Uh, вот она их просто уничтожила всех. Uh, just for the land and everything. And they, so, uh, there were not even a commitment to cooperate. So they were making deals and they, they were so trying to uh, they were making deals with Ukrainians, uh, but then they were ruining it and never никогда их не придерживались. Любой взять договор между Украиной и Россией, он был нарушен. Даже договоры там 91-х годов, ну, 90-х, там, что мы отказываемся от ядерного вооружения, мы не нападаем. Что он нарушен? Ну, типа, это из современных примеров. И в принципе, вот, вот это и все, все отношения. То есть, there was no like together part. But, like Russia is still in the form of empire and of imperialistic thoughts. That the only way Ukraine should exist as is a part of Russia. So there was no like brother. They're like you're my thing. I own you. Uh, that's it. I think let, let me say something more more radical, but assume. I think what is happening now is because Ukraine was one of the most russified. I'm, I'm not justifying, I'm, 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 I'm saying in terms of the consequences of the Soviet regime of the 70, seven decades of the, of the, of the, of the communism, yes? And I think because of this high rate of, of russification, it was so difficult and and uh, it takes so long to uh, to go apart, to, you know, independently. I think. Uh, uh, let me explain. I think if in '89, which is the subject of the of the second movie, yes, basically the, the first half of the movie, if Ukraine had a very clear cut sense of national identity. If the majority, if there was a consensus among the elites, uh, communists, non-communists, uh, related to where we are going, as it was the case in the Baltics, with Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, Ukraine could avoid this long, long transition, and of course the war with Russia. But because because Ukraine was so Russified, and I'm giving you some figures uh, related to the capital, Kiev, in 89, even though ethnic Ukrainians made uh, about 70% of the population. You know how many schools in Ukrainians have the capital? Only about 20%. 80% of all these schools, basically less in Kishinev, actually, in Kishinev, we have only three or four schools in, in, in Romania, yes? And, and, uh, and now you have uh, more than a half, more than, more than the, the, the Romanian speaking are proportional in the city, basically, yes? Uh, so so this, this shows, and of course, in, in, uh, in Ukraine, there is a regional divide, the way in the western parts of Ukraine, they understand the identity and Ukraine, and of course they, they, they. But but from the movie you see that um, when I'm talking about Russification, it's about the the cities basically, yes, because the the first movie is about a district area in the Kiev region, and you see everybody speaks in Ukrainian. So I think when we when we're talking about Russification, yeah, Soviet Union Russification, we should uh, we should have in mind cities, urban areas, and villages. In the villages, there is a perpetuation. The regime tolerated, if not encouraged, of course, but basically tolerated the the manifestation of national identity, perpetuation of national identity, schools. Because we were saying, you know, so that Moldova was Russified. It's true, but it's about urban areas. In the villages, my village, everywhere where the Moldavian 
Romanian speaking were majority, you had the school in Romanian, no problems about that. And you had uh, these kind of uh, popular sounds and dancing and whatever you wanted. But when you came, when you decide to go to the, to the urban areas, even to the district centers, no schools in, in, in the national languages, all over the Soviet Union basically. So, so it was the idea, if you want to live better in the, in the city, please change your identity. Please, please melt yourself and leave your clothes directly and directly where you came from, you see? So I think we should have this in mind. What do we, we want to say about, uh, and, and what happened in the, the, this long period of transition is that the, the villages in a democratic society or democratically oriented society, the villages takes revenge. And it happened everywhere actually, in, in Eastern Europe. At the end of the First World War, Prague was a German city actually, German speaking, because of the the empire, the German, uh, German dominant language, yes. And the elites were Germanized, the aristocrats and so on, so on. And, and there, is, there is a revenge of the history. The peasants are those who are nationalizing the urban areas. And let me uh, go closer to the subject of our discussion in Ukraine. I think in Ukraine, in post-Soviet Ukraine, uh, there was a positive trend in this sense. The, 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 the cities were nationalized. Uh, Kiev, first of all. Um, of course, it was easy in the western part, in Ternopol, for Ivanov and Kivsk, in Lviv, and so on and so on. But was more complicated and even failed in, uh, in the southern part, in the eastern parts of Ukraine in Donbass area, in Kherson, in other areas. And I think here is, is, was, was Putin's calculation that, that, that the Russian speakers, Odessa of course, but in Odessa it's a different story. And it's an interesting lesson what is happening. You know, that Putin, uh, Putin hoped that Russian no, language, Putin, speaking, no. speaking Russian, Putin, no. is translated directly in they want to be with Russians. Yeah. And the, the big lesson of this war is that speaking uh, Russian is not, uh, is not saying you want to live with Russia. And actually Odessa sent this message first in May 2014, yes, when, when they had this failed uh, coup d'etat, let's say, at the local level, yes. They understood at that moment that, uh, but they didn't want to understand that. Uh, so, so I think uh, Putin was encouraged in his war because he hoped that this, this Russified cities or Russian speaking cities of about half of Ukraine or one third of it would welcome the liberators, let's say. And I, I remember with Donbass, actually, we had the same question. Your Donbass is our Transnistria, yes? I remember mm -hmm. one case in, I was at a conference in 2004, 2004, in Bucharest, on uh, frozen conflicts in the post-Soviet space. And there were people from Ukraine, of course, from Georgia, from Moldova, we were talking about that, you know, officially and then unofficially, some 50, 50, 50, and that. So in this, in this context, uh, we discussed about Transnistria, and I became generous, you know, I, I thought I was the president of Moldova for one second, and I said, if I would be uh, Moldova president, I would say to Ukrainians, take Transnistria. The most important thing is not, uh, is, is uh, uh, that the Russians should not have it. So basically, the, the less worse uh, would be to give uh, Transnistria to, to Ukraine. And the, the reaction of the Ukrainians was very interesting. 2004, again, they said, if you give us Transnistria, we will give you back as a present 
Дон Бас. Это здесь по, по детальне, пожалуйста. They said, they said, they said, we are feeling like going in another country when we go to Donbass, to Donetsk, mm -hmm. especially, yes. Mm -hmm. We feel we are not welcomed. So, so there is a sense of, of, of division and, and, and uh, you know, the coming storm, at least from 2004. We have a as cultural workers. So we have an international festival and was involved uh, Moldova, Ukraine, and uh, um, East, and the uh, country from the EU countries. Mm -hmm. So, I, and we need to decide where will be uh, festival mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. And Ukraine don't want to, uh, they can't to find the place to, where to, to do. They don't want to go to the West. They don't, go, don't want to make in the Kyiv, because Donbass don't want. Uh, in the Lvov also, they don't want mm -hmm. because they too. So we can see mm -hmm. uh, three different regions that uh, struggle between them, and they yeah, decided. But it's not consensus. So. Yes, and they decided to make here in Moldova. So they came uh, off uh, Ukraine workers. And <laughs> yeah, and you have it's this division. It's decision to make and here, you, but not uh, all yes, and, these three places. And, and after the parliamentary and presidential elections, you had these divisions on the map yeah. with colors, Parque Regionov. Mm -hmm. The west center center was kind of half and half, something like that. But you have these three Ukraines, and identity actually was every time about Avenis, we and the others, to differentiate us. So, so in the in the Ukrainian case, in the Moldavian case as well, the problem was the high rate of Russification of the elites in the urban areas, and at the same time the lack of another uh, identity marker to, to differentiate us from, the, uh, uh, us from, the, from the dominant nation. In some cases, in the Irish case, for instance, yes, they, they lost their language, basically. They're English speakers, but they are Irish. You know why? because they had a religious marker. They were Catholics. Through Catholicism, they perpetuated their sense of, of being different from them. Ukrainians and Moldavians, we have, we have a lower sense of identity also because our elites were highly Russified and because religion did not help us to differentiate from the dominant world. But even more, it helped us to feel closer to the to the dominant nation. Yes. But see, different so the only the only identity marker uh, uh, was the language, and we learned it. No racial differences, for instance, uh, in the case of uh, Central Asians, they had some kind of. Yes, um, in our case, Ukrainians and, and, and the Russians and, and Moldavians, we didn't have any kind of physical difference from the, the Russians, basically. Uh, orthodoxy sharing the same, except some areas in the Western Ukraine, of course. Uh, but basically, I think this is explaining this kind of tragedy of Ukraine and Moldova being very, very slow in, in this way of, of becoming really independent from the metropolis. Yeah, but, but uh, what do you see difference between yeah, yeah. German and Austrian uh, people? How they uh, see his own identity? Because the language yes. is the same? It's a good question about Germany and, and uh, Austria. And actually, this is, this is uh, useful in terms of comparing Moldova and Romania. Uh, and the, the best answer, probably, and shorter answer to this question would be uh, to tell you a short uh, resume, a resume of, of uh, my meeting with uh, an Austrian PhD. Uh, it was a girl about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, she came here to do some archival research, and he asked me, tell me the difference between Moldova and why, why Moldova are different, or tell me 
what is about no, it's no, Romanian, no, 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 no. Romanian Moldavian divide, let's say. I said it, it would be very easy if you're coming from Austria. And I started to, to explain to him, he said, okay, understood. And he, t he told me, he told me, he said, yes, in 45, only 20% of Austrian population identified themselves as Austrians, 80% identified as German. German speaking, of course, and German, yes, ethnicity. And in 89, there was an opinion poll or census, and she said the proportion was vice versa. In 89, only 20% of the Austrian population identify themselves as German and 80% as Austrians. So this is the result of state policy, linguistic identity politics, textbooks, uh, uh, cultural events, and so on and so on and so on and so on. So on. Mass media and so on and so on. So, so this is about uh, language construction, nation building, whatever you can call it. So it the same is in, in, in the Moldavian case. Uh, you see that this is like in 99, in let's say late 80s, it seemed that uh, classification could not be overturned. But what, what, is, what, what was happening in the last 30 decades showed that it could be overturned. Also through state policies, uh, textbooks, literature, mass media, and so on and so on. It could be what I missed the side. What if you in the overturned? What that can be done? different uh, opinion polls about how many are identified as Romanians, probably 50, 20, not more, percent of the population. Which, is, which, is, which seems not too many, but if you think about the five decades of the Soviet regime, when identifying as Romanian was uh, demonized and even uh, uh, criminalized, yes, uh, I think it's a very, very positive uh, And at the same time, I think those who insist on being uh, identified as Moldavians, they don't see that very different from Romanian, just kind of, it's about the state, it's about not only Soviet history, it's not only the, our history of independence, but also kind of medieval, kind of Stephen the Great, and so on and so on and so on. The most important thing for me is that uh, the more people are identifying with Romanian language, which is a big breakthrough. And otherwise, the identity issue, Moldavians and Romanians, will be open for many, many decades from now. But this is, I think, it's secondary, so basically. So you, you have right to choose who you are, but you don't have the right to say what language, is, what language you, you speak. And actually, if you want me to connect with Ukraine, I think after the Prague Spring, actually, we have the second uh, big campaign of Russification. Because in '68, the Soviet regime have seen that the, the Moldavians were very sympathetic to to Ceausescu, who criticized the Soviet in the invasion of Czechoslovakia. And at the same time, uh, Ukrainians, and you have uh, Piotr Shelest ousted uh, from power in 72 as a result of this anti-nationalist campaign in the Soviet Union, uh, they have seen that this post-war border between Soviet Union and uh, Eastern Europe uh, was, um, let's say, was very, very thin. Why? Because 
the ideas of the Prague Spring were made popular in Ukraine. You know why? Because in Czechoslovakia, there was a Ukrainian radio station. Communist, but communist in a different way. So they, they started this second campaign, Russification, of the Soviet West, Ukraine and Belarus and, and, uh, and uh, Moldavia, uh, because they wanted to, uh, through, through the Russian language, to divide, to, to separate, let's say, these areas from the, from the Western influences, us from, from Romania, you from other, from your diaspora was very radical in, 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 uh, in Canada, Alberta, and other areas, and so on and so on and so on. So Russification was an instrument to create a different uh, identity, to make it closer to the dominant nation, and at the same time to separate us from the outside world, let's say. 